Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the afternoon session of uh, the conference. We have two presenters this afternoon and two commentators. Each presenter will have 20 minutes and then the commentator will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll hold a 30 minute discussion and then we'll move to this next paper. So I'm delighted to present uh, our first uh, presenter, uh, Professor Dr. Elit Ferber. Elit is an assistant professor of philosophy at Tel Aviv University. Her research deals with the philosophy of emotions. Elit has published numerous articles on Benjamin, Freud, Leibniz, Heidegger, Scholem, Herder, and others. Her monograph, Philosophy and Melancholy, Benjamin's Early Reflections on Theater and Language, was published by Stanford University Press in 2013. Elite has also co-edited three books, uh, uh, Philosophy's Mode, The Affective Grounds of Thinking with Chagi Knan, published in 2011, Lament on Jewish Thought with Paula Schwebel, published in 2015, and Lament, Poetry and Thought in Gershom Sholem, published in Hebrew, with Galili Shachar as a co-editor. <coughs> and it's forthcoming this year. Elit is currently writing her second monograph on the relationship between pain and language in the writings of Herder, Benjamin, Wittgenstein, and Sophocles. Elit. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Shai and Hagai, for the invitation. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, one of the most well-known and widely accepted premises regarding the experience of pain is its singularity and private nature. Pain's violence isolates us from everything else, embedding us completely within our own suffering, so that there's nothing else but pain no world or objects, no relationships with other people, no past or anticipation, an utter withdrawal. But pain's isolating force is dual. It affects not only the sufferer herself, but also those outside pain's violent clench. Elaine Scarry famously addresses this problem when she ascribes to pain what she calls its unshareability. Using geographical metaphors of distance, Scary compares our relation to the pain of others to the character, I, qu I quote, of some deep subterranean fact belonging to an invisible geography. The pains occurring in other people's bodies flicker before the mind, then disappear. I would like to question this prevailing hypothesis regarding the inherent privacy of pain and suggest a different perspective. Although violence is necessarily exercised on an individual's singular, private, and secluded body or soul, its effects lie far beyond this immediate impact. So that pain's private nature is not only not its central problematic, but moreover, it obscures what I take to be the substratum of the experience of pain and violence. I will present my argument today through a close reading of two short essays in which Jean Améry describes his experiences of torture and imprisonment by the Nazis between 1943 and 45. Améry's writings present us with a strange perplexity. They are directly and explicitly based on his personal experiences, providing us with rare insights into the torture Améry has suffered, as well as its ongoing effects throughout his life, and yet, Améry's unique style of writing confronts the reader with an unexpected, even destabilizing experience. Though rooted in autobiography, his writings are handed to the reader in an almost distant or cold tone, as if emerging from someone whose cry of pain is so forceful that it breaks all given orders before almost immediately giving up, suffocating itself and falling silent. Améry's writings lack even a shred of self-pity, and never take on a traumatized voice while narrating the terrible experiences he had endured. 
that it is, uh, sorry, he had endured. So that it is very hard to find the pathos that we tend to look for in similar memoirs of Holocaust survivors. I quote from Amery, if one speaks about torture, one must take care not to exaggerate, he writes. What was inflicted on me in the unspeakable vault in Brandong was by far not the worst form of torture, end quote. This is only one typical example of what can be described as a, to can be described as a tone of understatement. Instead of inviting identification or empathy, Amélie situates us before him, the tortured, reporting all the details in the first person, and nevertheless asks that we not be shocked, not feel pity. Thus, the descriptions of pain are extricated from the private autobiographical context. In his essay, Torture, he writes, I dare to assert that torture is the most horrible event a human being can retain within himself. But very many people have preserved such things, and the horrible can make no claim to singularity." End quote. I'd like to take this statement as a starting point for the talk. My claim is that Améry makes a point of telling us something about violence as such rather than about the specific violence, no matter how horrible, that he endured. He tells us to resist our customary inclination to think of violence and pain only from the victim's perspective. That is, as an aggressive force exerted on an individual's body or soul. And to give up our instinctive embrace of identification or denial of the victim's suffering. There is, of course, no doubt that Améry experienced in his own flesh the terrible isolation inherent to the pain and segregation of torture. But despite this utterly personal experience, despite Améry's body and soul being at stake here, he stages the scene from the very first moment as a scene that occurs in the public sphere, in the world, in the world, and not opposite it. The uniqueness of Améry's suspension of intimacy when describing his experience is what allows him to speak about the horror precisely as what is never private or singular, never belonging only to the one whose body is the very body hanging upside down from his wrists tied to an iron hook in the ceiling. This is a torture situation he describes. Violence, rather, <laughs> exposes something about us, all of us, and is therefore revealed to us all at the same time. What, is de what it demolishes is therefore not limited to the confines of a single body or mind. It shatters us all. At the beginning of the 40s, Amélie was a member of the Belgium resistance and took part in relatively minor activities, such as the distribution of anti-Nazi propaganda to Nazi soldiers, etc. He recounts being familiar with the testimonies and news regarding the possible dangers that would await him were he to be captured. And he recalls thinking that there could be nothing new for him, he writes. Everything was expected, prison, interrogation, blows, torture, in the end, most probably death. Thus, it was written and thus it would happen, end quote. Very soon, however, Amery discovers that the detailed information he had regarding his anticipated fate was only remotely connected to what indeed he would go on to experience. This is clearly not because Amari did not hold all the relevant data or that it was somehow inaccurate, but because the sphere dominated by violence is entirely different from the realm of data, information, or even that of testimony. I quote, that someone is carried away shackled in an auto is self-evident only when you read about it in the newspaper and you rationally tell yourself, well, of course, and what more? It can and it will happen like that to me someday, too. But the auto is different, and the pressure of the shackles was not felt in advance, and the streets are strange. And although you may previously have walked by the gate of the Gestapo headquarters countless times, it has other perspectives when you cross its threshold as a prisoner. Everything is self-evident, Amery writes, and nothing is self-evident. As soon as we are thrust into the reality whose lights blind us and burns us to the bone. 
this essential gap between reality and that which can be conceived as real is the nucleus of Amari's story. His account does not concern the inherent gap between reality and our conception of it, nor the chasm separating reality and imagination. These types of divergences has, have been discussed in the history of philosophy for centuries. Nor is it about a veil covering a horrendous abyss that is suddenly lifted when we are in pain. No, something else takes place here. It is the act of violence itself that opens up this gap. The brutal, ghastly strike, signaled by Amélie as the first blow, forcibly splits open the all too delicate fabric of human existence. It is, however, not only Amélie's own existence, but rather, as I'd like to claim, human existence as such. This sudden tear begins with a, with a uh, confined event taking place on a single body in one specific cellar in Belgium. It is at first almost invisible and does not yet threaten the strength and solidity of the entire fabric. Very soon, however, this small tear, and this is how small tears are, mm -hmm. widens, expands, and all too soon impairs our very stability and wholeness and hinders us from restoring them. This is a metaphor for what Amiri calls the collapse of our trust in the world. A certain unspoken, almost invisible certainty in the social bond and commitment to one another keeps us together as a collective human entity. Our trust in the world is thus founded on our conviction that others possess an elemental goodness and will respect our basic, our basic boundaries. And even if others hurt us, we know that we have all assented to the same social contract, unspoken yet strong according to which justice ultimately regulates itself. This certainty, however, buckles and breaks into pieces when the other violates us. It is no longer an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but someone, I'm quoting from torture, who knocks out the tooth and sinks the eye into a swollen mass. It is important to understand that this is not merely a collapse that is felt at the moment of pain or surprise. And it is not even limited to the shattering of our belief in the goodness of others. I understand Amiri to be making a much wider claim here. What he calls trust in the world is not a mere piece of information that can be acquired. Trust gradually growing up of our, up of our life experience and is carefully pieced together from many fragments of memory and feeling the mother soothing her aching child, or the doctor who prescribes the medicine that provides relief. In almost all situations in life, Amélie explains, where there is bodily injury, there is also the expectation of help." End quote. There is nothing we can do to rectify this violation of our bodily borders. The use of the term border here has two implications. First the other human being who uses violent force to cause <coughs> me or us pain, collapses with his very hands the delicately balanced border separating between our bodies. Second, with this very strike, another border emerges. And this time it is not a delicate, but fierce and thick. This is the wall that stands between my own vulnerability and suffering on the <coughs> one side and the belief that the world, or at least someone in it, will come to my rescue on the other. The collapse of the border, therefore, instantly erects another one. But this time, it is strong and threatening. And more importantly, this second wall will not be so easy to tear down. I'm skipping a paragraph if you're following the text. Pain and violence are obviously part of our world the flesh of our humanity. And yet it is impossible for such an experience to take place in our world. This paradoxical nature is the reason why we cannot treat the violent act as something non-human, standing outside the borders of the human. It is here, right here. Yet violence, when it emerges, appears before us as something that cannot be part of a world in which we take part violence and pain are human and inhuman at the same time. 
a part of our very world, yet impossibly part of it. Violence and pain appear together with the impossibility of their appearance. They are starkly present, yet this present is un presence is unbearable. With the first blow, violence transcends the confines of the individual's pain and instantly becomes the founding and constitutive principle of human existence as such. One can no longer rise above the space of violence or pain. It is not a process of deterioration of our values and principles, not merely a sickness of the mind which slowly crumbles. The violence of pain appears in an instant, a flash, from which there is no return or transcendence. The violent act not only violates the body or soul, injures it, opening up, opening up its covering, protective skin. It violates the very possibility of surpassing it. From this instant, violence becomes our only possible yardstick. Everything can now only be measured against it in and on its own terms. There is no longer causality, logic, or trust, only pain. This is what constitutes the experience as relentless and unremitting. I'm quoting, whoever was tortured stays tortured. Torture is ineradicably burned into him, even when no clinically objective traces can be detected. Ameri then adds, it was over for a while. It is still not over. 22 years later, I'm still dangling over the ground by dislocated arms, panting and accusing myself. In such an, an instance, there is no repression. Does one repress, does one repress an unsightly birthmark? And forth. The uniqueness of Amery's writings above survivor or in relation to survivor memories, lies in his ability to express the twofold and tragic nature of violence and pain. The autobiographical experience, private traumatic memory, and the survivor's terrible testimony are put forth together with, and not at the expense of, Amery's ability to describe the experience of pain and violence as essentially transcending the private subjective realm. I suggest that we read Amery as follows. The singular victim is not the protagonist occupying the stage who demonstrates unbearable suffering through his tortured, lace-rated body, nor is it about our strange attraction to pity him. The description of the specificity of torture is not mutually exclusive with universal implications of pain and violence. On the contrary, and here lies Amélie's greatness, the personal conditions the universal, allows it to appear, and in such starkness. It is not, of course, my intention here to undermine or weaken the suffering and cruelty of the single blow on a specific body. However, and here is the point, its echoes or the echoes of this blow always resound far, very far, from one particular body or event. Despite the specificity of its affliction, it always has to be directed towards someone or something, violence hits with all its force everything that is human, breaking what makes up our world into pieces. This portrayal of pain in which a single strike necessarily and immediately touches all of humanity, in which a single assault in a dark cellar forces an irreparable tear into humanity's fabric, might sound like an ideal portrayal of humanity or morals. This description, however, fails to grasp the reality that this fabric has long been worn out and tattered from acts taken in cellars, from countless blows and humiliations, and it is now slit and shredded throughout. This is why, according to Amery, I quote, whoever has succumbed to torture can no longer feel at home in the world. End quote. It is here that his crystal clear writing is transformed from prose whose voice is collected to a series of sad wails of someone who feels that he is utterly and deeply incurable. This metamorphosis 
happens not because he himself cannot obliterate the horror, and not because of the terrible, almost physical memories of his pain that he bears that will never, he now grasp, go away. The reason for it lies elsewhere, perhaps in an unexpected place. It emerges when the tortured takes leave of the dark cellar and re-enters the human world that, surprisingly to him, still stands. It is outside the cellar, in the world that Amerina realizes that can truly and utterly erase the cellar or the pain. When the wounds heal and the tortured body exits the cellar and ventures back into the world, that he sees that nothing has changed. The sturdy dividing wall that rose up in place of the vulnerable border of human trust that had collapsed with the first blow, this wall now marks a thin, almost invisible, but impenetrable line. It separates those whose bodies were subject to pain and violence and those who were not touched by its hand. It is still true that we are all human and we all share the same world. However, at the same time, we belong to two completely different worlds. Given that something is impossible, yet plainly possible, the world will thus never be the same again although it seems the same, or perhaps because it seems the same. I'm concluding. What then does Amery leave us with? Should we be satisfied with his testimony about this unbridgeable gap between the pained, suffering ones and those who can only regard such pain from afar? Should we remain aloof to such a dispiriting conclusion? Or should we perhaps aspire to the impossible, that is, to the complete, utter identification with the suffering of others, or to the desperate attempts to repair it? Clearly the answer is no. Such attempts are doomed to be sentimental, moralistic, or simply impossible, since even the deepest, most committed identifications would never turn us into those who were hung with their own wrists up upside down from a cellar's ceiling. Perhaps we have to sat settle for a diminished possibility, the o sorry, the only one we still have, and acknowledge that the only response still at our disposal is to feel this gap, to acknowledge that we cannot principally take part in the suffering of others, nor can we mend it. Perhaps this thin acknowledgement is what will be our own portion of pain, pain stemming from the fact that we too, and not only Amery, can never really feel at home in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Elit. Uh, Leora Bilski will comment on uh, Elit's paper. Uh, Leora Bilski is a full professor at Tel Aviv University's Faculty of Law and the director of the Minerva Center for Human Rights at Tel Aviv University. She clerked for the Honorable Aaron Barak on Israel's Supreme Court. She was a visiting professor at Toronto University and Amherst College, and a fellow in the Ethics and Professions Program at Harvard University. Leora is the author of Transformation, Transformative Justice, Israeli Identity on Trial, published by Michigan University Press in 2004, and The Holocaust, Corporations and the Law, forthcoming by Michigan uh, University Press. Leora's research interests include law after the Holocaust, political trials, transitional justice, international criminal law, feminist legal theory, and the relationship between law, history, and memory. Leora. Thank you. Maybe I'll sit down. It's okay? Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Shai. Um, Alvin. So, what distinguishes Amari's testimony on torture? This is the question that leads Elite's investigation. Elite suggests that we read Amari's testimony on torture as attempting to avoid the two poles that are prevalent in contemporary discussions of torture. Uh, one, testimony on torture as objective information or data, and the second, 
testimony on torture as subjective uh, experience, for example, in truth commissions or in memoirs. I would like to add a comparative dimension to the discussion by comparing it to another testimony, or rather a failed testimony, <laughs> that is given by Katsetnik in the Eichmann trial, and with the way Shoshana Feldman attempted to interpret it with a psychoanalytic prism of trauma. I would like to suggest that this comparison can help us better see the uniqueness in Amari's position as suggested by Elite, but also point to an important element in Amari's testimony on torture, its temporal dimension, that is not discussed in the two essays Elite uh, refers to, but in Amari's essay, Resentments. So I would like to argue that only by adding the temporal dimension can we understand how Amari attempts to combine an autobiographical testimony by the victim with a moral stance directed to recreate the social world that has been shattered. So that's what I'll try to do shortly. So uh, let's begin with the comparison. Fellman points to three prevailing demands that support the credibility of uh, the eyewitness testimony in trial and uh, that stands in the way of uh, Katsetnik. The first is testimony, the demand to testify in the first person. The second, uh, translate uh, violence into speech, and the third testimony uh, in the past tense. So, and I argue that all three demands are confronted also by Amari, yet uh, unlike Katsetnik, he resists the temptation of silence. So how is it done? So let's begin with testimony in the first person. Feldman writes that since Katsetnik speaks in the name of the dead, he must remain like them, anonymous and nameless. He must testify under the title Katsetnik, concentration camp prisoner. And the memory of Auschwitz is the forgetting of the name. However, in a court of law, he cannot remain nameless or testify anonymously. Can law overcome this difficulty? Partly, in the ICTY, for example, the International Tribunal allowed anonymous testimonies by rape victims as an attempt to defend the witness and as part of the recognition of the victim's rights movement. However, Katsetnik refused to testify under his private name raises a principled objection. How to testify on a crime whose essence is to erase the humanity of its victims, persecuting them as anonymous victims, as statistical figures? In the Eichmann trial, the prosecution attempted a reversal. It sought to return the humanity of the victim by giving her a voice, by preferring the victim's testimonies over the Nazi documents. Katsetnik's refusal to testify under his name challenges this approach. Feldman explains that the, uh, that the prosecution's demand threatens to obscure a fundamental truth about Auschwitz. So this is the, what is the solution that Amari offers to the problem of testifying in the first person on torture? Elite presents us with a puzzle. Amari insists on the importance of giving testimony as a victim of torture, and still he gives us very few autobiographical details. He tries to avoid graphical descriptions of torture he underwent and minimizes the intensity of the pain. It argues that instead of pity or empathy, um, Amari puts before us the face of the tortured victim who gives the details in the first person and still asks that we are not be shocked nor feel pity. This, she explained, is done in order to resist our inclin inclination to think of violence only from the victim's perspective and instead to see it as a scene that occurs in the public sphere, in the world and not opposite it. The testimony is not reduced to a personal experience of torture, but about torture as a phenomenon it, how, of how it affects the social world uh, simultaneously. Um, uh, so in Elite's uh, uh, essay, she writes that Amari tries to combine the subjective with the universal, and she explains the personal conditions the universal and allows it to appear. I think this is an important uh, 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 distinction she makes. Despite the specificity of its affliction, it always has to be directed towards someone or something, violence hits with all its force everything that is human, breaking what makes up our world into pieces. Instead of assuming the torture is inhumane, he turns the uh, Amelie turns the question around and asks what turns the human sphere into one. 
how exactly does torture undermine the social world of humanity familiar to us? And the key lies in understanding the way, the way violence affects the conditions of trust in the world. So with the first blow, and that's the, uh, your title, uh, he, lo uh, he loses something we call trust in the world, the certainty that the other person will spare me. So let's go to the second uh, obstacle to this testimony. Katsetny faints in the beginning of his testimony and slides into silence. Feldman writes, sliding to the infinite, to the unconscious, to, to silence was paradoxically a physical reminder of the real, of the bodily reality. Silence in the court is usually a negative thing, a lack of legal meaning. This was the unintended legal innovation of the trial, to allow the silence created by the Holocaust to be heard, to articulate the difficulty of narr narrating the story of the catastrophe, the difficulty to tell and the lack of narrativity of the disaster, the unexplicable and uncontained trauma. We see here how the psychoanalytic framing allows Feldman to criticize Eichmann trial as concealing a truth about trauma but by demanding speech. While every trial seeks to translate violence towards uh, the body into words, uh, Katzetnik's testimony reverses this direction and returns the silent and suffering body into the center of the trial. When we turn to Amiri, we encounter a similar experience of the gap or abyss opened up by violence. However, Elite argues that it will be wrong to understand this gap as veiled by words. It is not a veil covering a horrendous abyss, a veil that is suddenly lifted. No, something else takes place here. It is the act of violence itself that opens up this gap. Amiri's writing is therefore directed to explicate the nature of this gap created by torture, how it affects the social world. But in order to do so, another obstacle has to be overcome, the temporal dimension of testimony. So testimony in the past tense, this is the third demand of testimony. Feldman uh, writes, the law requires that the witness can tell his story in the past tense. Katsetnik is not capable of seeing the Holocaust as an event that passed, but has to continue living it in the present as an unstoppable, return of a traumatic past that has not passed, a past that one cannot distance. So what is the time of Amiri's testimony? It seems that also for Amiri, the experience of violence does not allow a common ground, a seamless web that connects the present and the past. Amiri writes, whoever was tortured stays tortured. Torture is in it, and we heard it. Um, it was over for a while, it still is not over. So does this incapacity to put the past behind <coughs> undermines the possibility of testimony on torture for Amiri? Elite mentions it, but does not explore this temporal dimension. I believe Amiri has an in interesting answer to the time dimension, one that avoids the pitfall of, trauma, of the trauma framework while acknowledging the continuous presence of the torture for the victim and for the fabric of the social world. In order to understand how Amiri transformed this experience, I suggest briefly to uh, turn to another essay uh, on uh, resentment. In this essay, uh, he describes himself as a victim that is nailed onto his past, so much so that his demand um, seems paradoxical, that time will be turned back. Um, and he writes, resentment is not only an unnatural but also a logically inconsistent condition. It nails every one of us onto the cross of his ruined past. Absurdly, it demands that the irreversible be turned around and so forth. In order to be heard, Amiri undertakes to justify this temporal dimension of the victim's experience that has been condemned by moralists and psychologists alike. The psychological approach sees the healthy person as one that is not stuck in the past, but is willing to move on, to forgive, to reconcile. Thus, the resenting victim is understood under this lens as sick, suffering from trauma. His inability to treat the past as past is a sign of his sickness. And the moral approach connects to this understanding is one that extols forgiveness and reconciliation as the only moral stance, resentment, or revenge are re relegated to the realm of the emotions as feelings that surrender to the violence and to bodily pain. This is the very opposite of a moral stance, separating body and mind. 
Against these prevailing approaches, Amari und undertakes to speak as a victim in the first person, as one nailed to his past and committed to resentment. And Amari justifies this position by investigating the temporal dimension of violence. He opposes natural biological time, the time of the healing body, to, uh, and the time of society that is oriented towards the future to moral time, the one artificially imposed by humanity who refuses the passing of time and requires accountability. A forgiving and forget, I quote, a forgiving and forgetting induced by social pressure is immoral. Whoever lazily and cheaply forgives subjects himself to the social and biological time sense, which is also called the natural one. But precisely for this reason, it is not only extra moral, but also anti moral in character. Man has the right and privilege to declare himself to be in disagreement with every natural occurrence. It is here, thank you that we see clearly how for Amari, the very experience of violence, <coughs> of torture, that continues to accompany the victim as a continuous present, puts the victims on the side of morality. The victim who is nailed to his past, who refuses to forget or forgive, becomes a living reminder to society of its moral duty, of taking possession of its negative past. This, I believe, is where the essay on torture and resentment meet. The loss of trust in the world is turned into a moral stance or the demand of the victim. And he writes, Amari writes, the experience of persecution was at the very bottom that of an extreme loneliness. At stake for me is the release from the abandonment that has persisted from the time, that time until today. Elite articulates how this is connected to a lost trust in the world that Amari's testimony seems to point to his unbridgeable gap between the one who was tortured and the rest of the world. However, I think we should not stop here with the gap, because then we are back to Katsetnik and to silence. I think that Amari's testimony has a moral or normative dimension that seeks to find a way to respond to torture without reducing it to empathy with the suffering of the victim, but also without treating its testimony as a mere symptom of a disease or something that we despair of. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, Diora. We'll now take some comments from the floor, and then Elite, you will have an extended last word. OK? So please, David. Uh, just a quick question, maybe, of clarification. You mentioned, uh, Elite, um, the public staging of uh, torture. And I wonder what, what did you have in mind, because Amri, uh, emphasizes not only the loneliness, but the privacy of the scene of torture. I mean, unlike uh, traditional uh, ways of uh, torturing, like quartering in the public uh, square or, or um, uh, putting people on the stake, I mean, modern torture, uh, the kind of which Amélie was subjected to, takes place in cellars with no uh, witnesses and uh, uh, no, bear no testimony except for the a very private one of uh, the people involved. Now, this has also uh, some echo in the Ressentiment uh, essay, in which I remember that uh, not only was the scene of torture private, uh, but also the correct response to torture is his fantasy about the one-to-one facing each other of the torture and the tortured. This is the only really moral response. It does, it's not really in the public sphere. It's not a uh, public revenge. It's not justice. Uh, it's just him and his torture. If he could do the, undo the past, you know, and face the, his torture, that would be it. That would be. And that's a very, a, a, a typically private kind of a, a fantasy because the world would not be able to understand the, a, the, the situation anyway. And the small a, a response to Liora's I, I, a comment, I a, agree with almost all you said, but I think you missed the last part in which Amri says specifically in the Ressentiment mm -hmm. uh, essay, that it's not going to work. I mean that uh, undoing the past 
is not only logically impossible, but a society would not be able ever to understand it because society is a biological uh, a entity, living entity, oriented always to the future, and hence the, uh, the unbridgeable uh, gap. And in my reading, that's the ultimate cause of his uh, <coughs> uh, or choice of um, suicide. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, yeah, well, I agree. Uh, I think that um, uh, I'm, I'm picking up on the last, uh, on your last sentences. I think that uh, this uh, logically impossible, right, the end of the uh, resentment uh, essay, uh, comes together with uh, this impossibility that is revealed uh, to Amri in the experience of torture. So uh, this, there were a few parts that I took out, but. Uh, in them I described precisely uh, the, the version of this uh, logical impossibility, right? The complete uh, turning on over on the head uh, that he describes in, in uh, the essay titled The Mind's Limits, where he describes mm -hmm. the, the life in the camp. And he says, well, you had to be without a, with a button, but you couldn't have a button. So the whole, so there is a transformation in the, in the laws of society, right? In, in, in uh, not only on the moral level, but in how things actually, you know, in the daily life work out. And, uh, and this is all transformed. And uh, so it is not only uh, this, pr perhaps weaker kind of formulation of it's impossible that I'm experiencing such pain or it is impossible that someone tortures me, but uh, the laws of logic, right, causality, <laughs> all of this is completely transformed. So the world is transformed. Um, and uh, this also has to do with, um, and I'm taking it back also uh, to your response, uh, with uh, this moral kind of, uh, um, uh, law, so to speak, that he wants to, to pose to us, right? Or this reminder. So you're saying uh, that it's not enough just to uh, uh, point at the gap, right? Just to say, well, it's impossible. That would be, that would amount to silence. Uh, but this moral stance uh, is also impossible, right? So I can't really turn time back. So if this is the moral option or if this is the moral demand, that this, then it means that there is no solution to the problem. Um, so that's kind of a connection. And um, regarding this, the privacy, the question of privacy, uh, uh, of course, uh, this, this description of the seller goes very well together with what we uh, generally uh, take to be this privacy uh, of pain. So it, of course, it's not a metaphor. It's a real event, but it, it goes nicely, so to speak, together. Um, but my point here was to say that uh, this, um, uh, giving it this title of privacy, right, and this whole problem of communicability that we, we've heard about and uh, scary unshareability, uh, is, is maybe this is uh, the problem that you were speaking about regarding my paper, right? That it just presents us with the gap. Whereas my point about the public sphere was to say that even if it's a seller, even if there's no witnesses, right? Even if it's only me and him, and he does emphasize that, you're right, uh, it's not a seller or it's not really private, right? It's, it's part of the world that we all share. And uh, our ability uh, to suppress these events that take place all the time, right, around us, is, uh, is the easy way, right? It's, it's the e way of privacy, it's to say, well, I can't really understand pain, right? Of course, torture has the political context, but also in other talks that we've heard uh, in these two days, right? I can't really understand, I can't really feel the other's pain, right? These famous problems. Um, somehow simply present the gap, right? Without um, taking any form of responsibility or, or commitment to uh, other people's pains. So that was the kind of play with the privacy versus the public uh, sphere. Yes, please. Not, um, and not to be shocked, and the problem of violence as such. Uh, thank you. 
and not from the victim's perspective, um, if we consider the, the wrongdoing. So I'm asking myself what's so special about torture since those are principles that we all familiar with from uh, original criminal law. Even decades ago, criminal law was perceived uh, as treating crimes or violent crimes as crime against society and not uh, specifically against, uh, against the victim, the people against uh, the offender. So if we talked about uh, as a matter of society, then any, almost any crime is a matter of the society against the, uh, the offender and it doesn't matter if it was happening in a cellar, in the public square. Um, so what's so special about, uh, about torture? Is it the element of pain? Is it the element of violence? Um, so what's, what's so special about it? That's what I'm trying to understand, what Amiri has to say that we didn't know even before when we thought about criminal law. Violence, but then we can, uh, but, but then we would say that uh, we can speak in parallel of uh, violent crimes, right? So I would not say that it has to do with any crime, but uh, it might have to do with violent crimes, right? Intentional violent crimes, uh, and um, I would say, on the face of it, you're right. I mean, there is a connection. It's very interesting what you're pointing at, right? The, the society against. Uh, but what we do have in torture, and I, I didn't go into it here uh, in this talk, is uh, this uh, very strong uh, relationship uh, in torture between pain and language. And uh, this is a point that Scary makes in, in her uh, book, uh, but it's also something that uh, goes beyond her uh, argument in the sense that uh, language occupies um, a very uh, important role there because Again, it depends on the, on the case of torture that we're speaking about, but, but uh, in most cases, right, when there is an interrogation, right, and I torture in, in the course of an interrogation, um, I'm, I want information, right? I, I need to kind of extract um, uh, linguistic da data uh, from my victim. Uh, so this is the one, one uh, sort of function, so to speak, uh, of torture, and of course the other side which I, I uh, discussed earlier is the fact that uh, violence uh, and pain uh, deprive us of our language, right? I mean, they, they, they you know, depends uh, on your perspective, but uh, for instance, Carrie said, well, it, it uh, brings us back, if there's a regression to a, a pre-linguistic stage, uh, an animal, barbaric, etc. So there is this very, for me, for my own uh, personal perspective on the topic, it's uh, this uh, kind of uh, encounter between language and pain in torture is a specific, more, more specific than uh, in uh, other cases of crime, for instance. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, to the last question, I, I think that torture is different in a different way than pain in language. It's state torture. And uh, when we say in criminal law that uh, it's a crime against society, this was not so uh, in, in this torture. Society or the state is the criminal one, is the, the one inflicting this. And this has a completely different understanding of abandonment or of trust that is uh, in uh, uh, ordinary uh, crimes. So, and I think without this, uh, uh, without this we cannot uh, understand uh, uh, the wider context of uh, how, the, uh, how torture is differentiated and why in international uh, conventions we demand this state uh, uh, part to it. Now, uh, as to uh, David's uh, 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 correction that, um, that uh, even the moral stance is impossible for Marie, I think it's interesting to think about it not as something, okay, impossible, so we give up on the moral stance. Mm. Ameri wants this impossibility to be a continuous present of the society that has to <coughs> continuously engage with its uh, uh, failed or its negative past and continuously fail it. But uh, uh, th this is a, a dialogue that is going on, and so I think we can have a moral stance. And it's possible only if we recognize its impossibility, that, that the past will not be restored. That th this uh, that this uh, uh, imagination 
uh, is distorting our moral stance. So this is, I think, coming uh, partly in this. And uh, finally, to, to also to uh, elite, what made me move in, in this response is this difficulty that testimonies on the Holocaust like Marie and like your interpretation of it, tend to be more and more <coughs> testimonies about gaps, limits, and so forth. So they become like the testimony of the limits of language, of the limits of, and then they are disconnected from the testimonies on, on torture that we know as a political stance or as a legal stance or, the, or moral stance of changing something in the world. And I think that it is, in Amiri, I see trying to connect the two, and I see the danger in Feldman, in Agamben, in others to disconnect it. So I, I think this, is, this was the purpose of my intervention in this. Can I uh, answer back? <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I agree, and, uh, and um, maybe, uh, maybe a possible answer uh, would be to take this possible and impossible, and I completely agree that, that uh, the whole point is to present, not only to say, well, it is impossible and so we move on, but rather to present that there is a possibility of having something that is possible yet impossible mm -hmm, at mm -hmm. the same time. So there is something that's kind of, again, transforming the, the laws of logic, right? So it's not a, a simple negation, so to speak, right? There's something uh, dialectical about it, and that's what happens or what presents itself in torture, because, you know, the kind of daily logic <coughs> is it either it's A or not A. But torture, pain, and the moral solution stands even uh, uh, presents in a very powerful way the fact that it is not as simple as that, right? That there is a possibility to experience, I would say, the possible and the impossible uh, together. Uh, referring to the political dimension of torture, Judith Klar uh, puts forward a very minimalist understanding vision of the liberal state that it won't torture us, and that's enough. That's sufficient. Shai. Okay. Um, I guess uh, this is just to kind of make sure I understood the the, the exchange. And um, so there's there's a way in which take the ordinary case of crime and punishment, in which there's a close affinity between the crime and the punishment. The crime is violent, and the punishment, in many ways, also exerts violence. And for lawyers. And for philosophers, the question is always, what is the difference between the violence of the crime and the violence of the, of the punishment? And so from what I understand from the discussion, this is, there's a similarity here in this question between the crime and now the witnessing of the crime. So that the, the crime of torture does something, for example, to temporality, to subjectivity. And there's a question of how, what relationship will the witnessing have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the original crime. And how, and the one, so the Katsetny case, I think, is an interesting one where there's, there's a repetition with a difference. That is that the, uh, with respect to, to temporality, there's an understanding that the, on the one hand, the torture or the, uh, the atrocities try to trap you in time. And, and, um, and that, the te that the witnessing, the testimony, also wants not to give up on this being trapped in time, but, but with, a, with a certain difference on, on how that, that happens. And so I guess uh, it would be helpful, I think, also in the, con the broader context of the, of the conference, if you could say a little bit more, maybe both of you, about how this uh, alternative temporality is supposed to, to work. So, there, so there, th we have the sequential time, the, the the time after time, the, the move from the past to the present to the future in a linear, linear way. And here there's a refutation of that understanding of time. But then, um, but then it seems to me that you were presenting different models. Lior brought this up, but this is also implicit in, in Amelie and in your presentation, brought up alternatives to this. And so the question, I guess, is can you say a little bit more about how the original crime of torture disrupts time? Uh, in Amiri, and how uh, the witnessing is supposed to uh, offer a different uh, temporality. Uh, 
thanks. Um, well, I have to think about it, but I'll just give a kind of a, a first short answer. Uh, I think that uh, one of the interesting um, um, things that happened to trem tre temporality or to temporal structures in, in uh, torture uh, is that it is not uh, sequential moment after moment, like you say, linear time versus no time or outside of time, but rather that there is a very strong sense of, of temporality when you're trapped alone in a cellar, uh, but it, is, it completely doesn't obey the, the, the usual right, um, feeling and understanding of, of time that we have, and that is that there is only time, right? that we're trapped in, in time, not only in the sense that we're trapped in the past, etc., but that we feel time itself differently because it is no longer, you know, time that structures our routines, our projects, our plans, our hopes, our regrets, but uh, it is only time, so it's pure time, pure temporality. Uh, but I'll, I have to think a little bit more about that. It's a difficult uh, question. I'm thinking about testimony in the, in the courtroom has to be a reenactment of the crime. So in a sense, it, it, uh, it puts us back in the present time and also because it is, uh, in the, the, the future is not yet there in the trial because we don't know what the verdict will be. So in a sense, it's, uh, it, go, it goes back and again, we don't know what's, uh, what's, the, uh, what's the, the sense, but, but still it has to be in the, in the past, so uh, the traumatic uh, uh, witness is not believed, or this is. So I think this is what Amery is struggling against. How and this is why he minimizes the, the autobiography, and the, and 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 this is why he's struggling with how are you how are you listened to? Because if you are listened to as sick, there is no way for uh, so. Um, but uh, in preparation to this, I read many. Uh, testimonies of torture by Amnesty International, Bezalel, and so forth to see. And what I see there is the way they deal with it is completely to uh, uh, divide between the victim that is completely in the, the subjective testimony in present time, and then there is the objective voice of the human rights organization that interpret it. So in this way, they separate the two, and that was so wonderful in Elite's uh, uh, paper to show how uh, Marie resists this uh, uh, simple solution, I think, that is being repeated uh, uh, again and again. So. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, the, this last discussion with Amnesty Inter International and the separation, it, it seems there's a universality uh, as emphasized, but there's a kind of ethical frame required in relation to the testimony. And what makes the amnesty kind of case problematic, it, it seems, <coughs> is the way kind of there's a broader purpose or frame that that you then make use of the testimony of the tortured person for in such a way that they become sort of incidental to that use. And there's something about the testimony that requires a kind of pause and recognition that the only legitimate access is by means of the testimony of the victim that underwent it. And sort of whatever purposes, whatever making universal of that, um, it, it's sort of on the terms offered by the one who's giving the testimony. There's not, unlike other cases of universality, kind of getting around and behind the testimony to test and verify and justify. And, and I wonder if that, so does that, this, the universality that you're pointing to, does, does that need for the pause and only working it 
forward to the degree offered by the one giving the testimony, does that change the judgment on, on universality, right? It's a very, it seems it's a very special kind that's associated with the testimony. Well, um, I would say that this uh, unique type of universality um, uh, has to do uh, with this uh, really interesting uh, test cases of, of real testimonies, right? Uh, amnesties. Uh, style testimonies, which, um, like Leora says, have kind of an internal split in them, right? Between the personal subjective, we can add in brackets, you know, maybe not completely reliable, or I don't know, uh, testimony versus the data, right? And I think, uh, at least that's how I understand uh, what Amari is doing here, is that the, the project, so to speak, uh, in these texts is to um, challenge this um, uh, um, essential separation or the, or the demanded even uh, separation and to say that uh, there is un a universality can be revealed or I would even say there is only uh, universality when there is the person or the subjective, right? the not, not the clean um, uh, testimony. So, and moreover, it is not that the universal is a kind of a, a scheme, right, that can be um, concluded from many subjective testimonies, many personal testimonies, and I will see, you know, what's the kind of common structure. That's not the universal in, in, in this context. So the universal would be something else. It would be something that can be, can reveal itself only from the personal and the, from the subjective, and not, not uh, without this structure of, of, of a separation. And this was the sentence that you, uh, that you quoted, which which uh, is very important for me in in this talk, which is this uh, using the term condition, so the the subjective conditions, the universal, but not in the not in the simple way, right? The sum of. Hi, please. Uh, well, uh, thank you for this untortuous paper. <laughs> uh, I still wonder. How come that uh, Amiri doesn't reach the point of singularity? To me, it looks as if there is some kind of alienation here. And the alienation is, it's one possible explanation, is <coughs> the suspension of the body. And it's not a suspension from the ceiling, of course. It's the, maybe that could serve as a metaphor, but it is the suspension of the body from his consciousness. It's another body. And in that sense, uh, torture is no different to medical treatment. In sometimes, particularly in hospitals, when we're subjected to uh, horrific medical treatments, with lots of pain, uh, our bodies are suspended. We suspend our bodies. We give our bodies away for a uh, torture doctor who inscribes on the body memories, memories to come, like in uh, Amiris case. And the body becomes kind of a slate <coughs> on which memories are written. And these memories are there to stay, as, 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 as you mentioned. They are there to stay, and this is also the solution to the temporal problem. Because this, is, this past becomes present perfect. It, it becomes something that will stay with that person. And as you said rightly, there is no post-trauma there. There is only trauma. It's, it's trauma for life. And, and by the way, it's a different kind of time. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the suspension of the body because uh, on the one hand you're right I mean the, the, the way that he describes it is really there's kind of a distance or an internal split on the other hand he uses uh, uh, various uh, uh, physical um, uh, images and metaphors of memory like you said or like the birthmark for instance, or like the sentences in which he said, well, that was a long time ago, and I'm, you know, I'm already healthy now, I'm working, I have a life, but I'm still hanging from the ceiling. I mean, I, he says, I'm, I'm feeling it in my body. So this, it's, it's a, a bodily, so to speak, uh, memory. Um, so, so it kind of, there is a dual uh, position here that he, uh, that he kind of moves uh, between. So between this constant, Body, bodily memory and this um, 
um, perhaps maybe the, the style of writing or the tone, which sounds as if it is detached from the bodily, immediate uh, experience. It's vastly between two bodies, there are two kinds of embodiments that work on one physical body. Okay, 30 seconds for the aura, Just and then uh, we move to... Because I think it's an important uh, question. First, uh, he uh, um, associates it with rape. He says that it is like rape. And I think it's important in this trust in the world because, uh, because uh, rape, the difference between rape and sexual uh, 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 intercourse that is uh, consented to is this exactly this trust that is, uh, uh, and then when you said the doctor and the torturer, what, uh, what differentiate this? It's torture no, nonetheless, but this trust is very different when we give up. So, uh, uh, and also what, what um, alarms me in what you say is that you read him again as a sick person who is uh, uh, alienated from himself in order to deal with the torture. And that's always, he's trying to, to, uh, to play the two roles. I am sick and I have to be heard of as a moral uh, stance. And how do we do this, the two at the same time? So uh, no, not to, to interpret what he, he says as a symptom of uh, yeah, sickness. So I, I read him as a survivor for some other reason. So, it 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 so what does it mean when you read him as a survival? So that will will just allow him to say whatever because he's a survival? Or is he like a, a university philosopher telling us he what's wrong us, about torture? He teaches torture. us how to survive. He teaches what? us how to survive. I'm not sure because he does not survive and he... It's moral <laughs> defiance. <laughs> and the suspension of the body is, of course, a term we hear time and again from prostitutes, needless to say. Okay, thank you very much, Elite, Leora. And we move now to our second uh, presentation.